Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamualaikum, my dear students. Today we are going to talk about postmodernism once more time, and then after discussing postmodernism, we'll talk about post-war novel and drama. This is my dear students, your lecture number 28, and the class is history of English literature, concerts, social campus, Islamabad. My dear students, in the last lecture we were talking about uh, postmodernism, and we didn't end up our discussion because this postmodern doctrine that is uh, really a very serious topic in the history of English literature. So that is why today again uh, I'll give you some more uh, you know points uh, relevant to postmodernism according to some theorist views. Okay, so definitely the second part of the uh, lecture today would be about post war novel and uh, drama so my dear students here you can see like again and again we are talking about uh, post 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 modernism post colonialism post war so my dear students here i'm just providing you the basis for what basically post modernism was what was their doctrine what was their philosophy and then we will move towards uh, the study of novel and drama during that period okay outline of the lecture today will uh, cover the remaining part of the last lecture postmodernism today then we'll uh, talk about two novelists one is uh, graham green and the other one is anthony powell these are the two uh, eminent personalities as far as the uh, novel of the postmodern period is concerned then we'll move towards uh, you know uh, post war drama so john obzone and samuel bakir uh, these two uh, dramatists will cover uh, today okay Michael Foucault. Let's start our discussion with the previous lecture today, like when we were talking about Derrida, deconstructionism, and you know other philosophers who were talking about what basically postmodernism is. So here we are going to take a start uh, again uh, from postmodernism philosophy. So here we are going to um, cover this theorist Michael Foucault. Okay. As he himself described, Foucault was a specialist in history of systems of thought. So basically, he was, uh, you can, you could say, like uh, he was a master of, uh, you know, history of systems of thought. So basically, how do we uh, make our thoughts, and then uh, how do we utilize those sources? He was a master of uh, everything. Although we often call him a French philosopher and historian, even though he wrote on a variety of subjects ranging ranging from science to literature. So basically, like uh, he talked about too many fields. Okay, so he is not just restricted to literature or to any other era. He talked uh, from literature to science. Okay. His works that have influenced the course of postmodern literature and literary criticism includes the Archaeology of Knowledge that was published in 1969, and then the Order of Things published in 1966, Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison, 1975, publication date, History of Sexuality, 1976, Power. Knowledge, uh, 1980, and then what is an author, which was published in uh, 1977, and last but not the least, uh, Madness and Civilization, which was published in 1961. So, my dear students, here you could see like uh, all uh, the books they are in jumbled up order. So, I did not, uh, you know, mention the books over here in uh, you know uh, in a chronological way, year by year. So, according to the requirements, I have added them in the slide here. Okay. So basically, he usually we uh, think uh, like uh, we often call him a you know a French uh, philosopher and historian. Okay, so my dear students here, by keeping in view his uh, major works over here, so you could see like the effects of these works on the postmodern literature. Okay, is very much uh, evident. So we'll talk about it. In the book listed last, uh, Foucault explores. So basically, this is madness and civilization. In the book listed last, that is the madness and civilization, Foucault explores how madness is socially constructed by a wide variety of discourses that give rise to collective attitudes or mentalities defining insanity. Its basic thesis is that, like the lepers of the Middle Ages, the mad are excluded in a gesture that helps to construct modern society and its image of reason. Foucault's major work examined the question why, in any given period, it is necessary to think in certain terms about madness, illness, sexuality, or prison. So, my dear stu students, as you could see, like with the passage of time, lang language changes. Okay, so if a language is fixed, that is static, so it would become a dead language. Okay, so he, along with the language, like uh, along with certain vocabulary items, the connotations which are attached 
attached with those items those would also be changed with the passage of time here you can see the concept of madness which was there in the middle ages so now if we look at madness there so that is having you you could say a totally negative connotation over here so that is a kind of disease as well my dear students when we talk about uh, Elizabethan literature so fool you could see in um, almost all of the comedies uh, written by Shakespeare fool is present uh, there in the book so you could see like a fool at that time he was the most uh, you know wise person of that time okay here with the passage of time you could see like uh, after Elizabethan age too many uh, new uh, innovations uh, were being explored in literature and in language as well so you could see today in today's world you know fool is uh, you know a, a person who is mad okay so here some negative connotations are attached with the word fool so same is the case with madness over here all right so with the passage of time we cannot say like any word that is static or we cannot give any attribute specific attribute to the world why because with the passage of time language changes and traditions uh, uh, also uh, keep on changing okay so my dear students basically this is uh, his work and he talked about uh, discourses as well wide variety of discourses like i told you that what do you mean by discourse that is language in action okay like we have medical discourse religious discourse political discourse females discourse as well so these are different varieties of discourses so he talked about all those discourses in details uh, you know in his works all right by clear implication he seems to ask if it is possible to think about those topics in different ways the effect of Foucault has been to view with distrust all that has been passing in the name of essentials, universals or natural and take all these as social construct reflecting the values of different cultures and societies. So my dear students here again we are going with the same doctrine of the postmodernist uh, you know view over here like uh, according to him uh, the names of essentials universals or natural something which is natural or going in a natural way or something which is very much important in the society or about the universal like about the universal truths and other universal elements uh, you could see in the society so what basically are the powers behind uh, you know identifying something which is uh, essential or which is universal or which is compulsory or which is natural okay and takes all these as social constructs so basically he is mixing social construct with all the naturals all the you know universals and the essential elements of life okay basically he is trying to say like uh, there is a social reality behind uh, defining what is important and what is not important what is universal and what is not universal so with the passage of time when different changes take place in a society so at that time we also define uh, you know uh, you know uh, we put emphasis on the importance of something as well okay the values of different cultures and societies so basically here uh, this is a depiction of the different cultures and societies as well something which is associated with uh, any universal truth or you could say any scientific formula as well or uh, you know anything that is very much important in the society so that is not something which itself is important but the uh, entire culture which is associated with it and the society which is uh, you know um, linked with that that one that is very much important so he focused on this view of looking at the discourse and the realities of the world okay in the history of philosophy Foucault's work falls within the tradition established by Nietzsche from whom he adopts the technique of uh, genealogy and the insight that the search for knowledge is also an expression of a will to power over others here you could see the search for knowledge is also an expression of a will so my dear students here like if you have uh, urge of getting knowledge or if you are willing to learn anything so that is that also plays an important role in genealogy that is a concept which is taken uh, you know by uh, Foucault from the uh, from uh, you know Nets gaze work okay for Foucault knowledge is always a form of power so basically his point of view is that those who are in power they produce knowledge so this is just a product of uh, power so whatever is there in form of knowledge in front of you like in form of literature in form of poems so these this is a power game that is a form of power 
He takes even psychiatry and mental health as new technologies that categorize certain forms of social and uh, sexual behavior as deviant in order to control them. So my dear students here you could see like uh, he is taking two uh, medical uh, you can say domains over here. One is psychiatry and the other one is uh, mental health and he is saying that these are also technologies and they are, these are also uh, you know involved in the formulation, formulation of uh, knowledge in order to control certain and, uh, you know uh, crimes or sins from the society as well okay my dear students uh these are based on you know certain forms of social and sexual behavior as deviant in order to control them so my dear students what is basically the characterization of any deviant you can say act in the society this is again a power game in order to uh, tell people that there's something which is not good okay something which is bad for them which is bad for their health might be or from which uh, they you know uh, they should not get themselves involved in that thing okay my dear students so they basically that was uh, the problem and these are the points of uh, uh, you know net is genealogy is uh, concept as well okay the modern psychiatrists assume the role of medieval uh, priest seeking confessions imposing the values of the empowered so my dear students here basically he is uh, trying to talk about a psychiatrist and he is saying that he is just like a medieval priest who seeks uh, confessions and uh, you could see like uh, who assumes uh, you know about the future of uh, uh, any kind of patient as well okay his thesis is that power is not something that one seizes holds or loses but a network of forces in which power always meets, meets with resistance so my dear students one more point which is very much important as far as Foucault is concerned whenever there is power there is resistance okay so basically you'll have to face certain challenges when you are powerful so sometimes you could say like a power power is also productive because it produces knowledge if we just go for you know the less dominating classes of the society or the inferior classes of the society so you could see power is uh, uh, suppressing for them but here he is saying like power uh, is uh, a kind of resistance as well when who those who are in power they'll have to face resistance at any time they'll have to face uh, challenges uh, all the time okay these views have led to the challenging of all sorts of political, social and gender constructs taken as networks of power to repress the weak, the individual, the disadvantaged, the female, etc. So my dear students here you could see like if there is male domination in the society, so definitely they, the males of this is very particular society, you know, uh, have to face resistance, okay, they'll have to face different kinds of challenges from females. If there is a, a domination of a white race in the society, so definitely there must be an element of, uh, you know, a resistance from the other side that is the black community so my dear students here you can see like those who are in power they produce knowledge and but those who are not powerful they you know uh, they challenge the you know uh, the ones who are in power okay Although Foucault's name was associated with structuralism and the controversial theme of uh, Barthes' catchy title, Death of the Author and Death of Man, his true concern remained with the ref uh, formation and limitations of system of thought, although made an icon of uh, cure theory. Foucault's contribution has been valuable to all the postmodern critical approaches, including the feminist, postcolonial, and post-structuralist. Okay, my dear students, so this is a, a very famous, uh, you can say, theorist in the history of English literature, and as far as postmodernism is concerned, so his views are taken everywhere. Okay, so basically, he is uh, being followed as far as feminism is concerned, or you could say postcolonial or post-structuralism is concerned. So he is, uh, you know post-colonial and post-structuralism are concerned so my dear students uh, he his views are quite valuable okay let me summarize uh, Foucault's uh, point of view what he says like uh, he says like uh, power is something uh, sometimes uh, uh, you know repressing sometimes that is uh, you can say um, productive as well okay
Okay, my dear students, here you could see like uh, he uh, basically gave uh, two point of views about the power. What is basically power? So those who are powerful, they produce uh, knowledge and they at the same time, they, they you can say repress the uh, weaker people of the society as well. So s knowledge, uh, according to him, is produced by the powerful authorities of the society. On the other hand, uh, you know, that is something which is productive as well. Producing knowledge is uh, an effective task in the society as well all right so these are the power games according to Michael Foucault okay another uh, theorist uh, uh, as uh, in the post modernism is Renan Barthé okay French literary critic and theorist Barthé has been quite influential among the post modernist writers and critics his principal concern despite his varied writing remains with the relationship between language and society. So my dear students, previously we were talking about discourse and power or language and power. Here we are moving towards another thing that is language and society. And with the literary forms the, that mediate between the two. The idea is that no literary composition can be studied in isolation, being one of the practices of a culture and expression of society's uh, ruling discourse. So my dear students, here he, he is just trying to to say that we cannot ignore society when we study literature so you could see over here like we cannot uh, read literature in isolation so the elements and the factors uh, from the society which are very much important in the formulation of that discourse those are very much important or of literature those are of you know primary importance so we cannot ignore society while studying uh, you could see literature or language so here you could see like uh, society is very much important uh, in the formulation of discourse or language all right Hence, study of a text will be useful if it is done in relation to other contemporary practices of the same culture. Even fashions of dress, cigarettes, smoking, or uh, you know, styles of uh, wrestling. Cultural studies, one of the aspects of post-modernist critical theory, although founded by Richard Hoggard, the uses of literary and Raymond Williams culture and society okay owes a good deal to the writing of Bartse as well so my dear students uh, here you could see like uh, he's just trying to say like uh, we cannot uh, uh, study any text uh, uh, without having uh, any relationship of the society with that text okay my dear students so we'll have to go for studying culture and even uh, you could see the examples over here like the uh, dress fashions or you can say cigarette smoking or the styles of uh, rest as well. So these are some of the examples. So we can study literature only if we know about uh, the entire society, about their culture. All right. So here, basically, he is just trying to say that we cannot separate culture uh, from literature. So study of text, study of any kind of language, uh, you know, culture plays a very important role. All right. Bart's famous work methodologies as well as his very first essay on writing in 1953 demonstrates that no form or style of writing is a free expression of an author's subjectivity. So my dear students here, he is denying a concept that subjectivity is although there but we cannot analyze any text uh, you, you know on the level of subjectivity only. That writing is always marked by social and ideological values that language is never innocent. So my dear students here, language is quite complex. It's not simple because the, in the formulation of language or the choice of language, you could see like some social and ideological aspects are also very much important. So my dear students, this is basically his point of view uh, about discourse, about language, about analyzing text. Okay. A sense of the need for a critic of forms of writing that masks the historical political features of the social world by making it appear natural or inevitable provides the impulse behind the analysis of methodology. So basically this is a all about his work and methodologies okay so that was published in 1957 so my dear students here you could see like he is saying like language is a uh, you know not innocent it means like language is not that much simple that we cannot just uh, uh, we cannot just study language in isolation there are the other factors like sociological factors so uh, ideological uh, factors which are involved in the formulation of language or the choice of language those are very much important according to Barthes okay Bart's other book include elements of semiology, writing uh, degree zero, uh, the player of the text and the death of the author, later included in image music text by Stephen Heath. In his essay mentioned last, Bart's pleads for abandoning the conventional authors and works 
approach in favor of an anthropological and psychoanalytical reading of uh, canonical text. So my dear students, again you could see the importance of anthropology and uh, uh, psychology in the interpretation of text in the in, in the formulation of uh, text as well so here you could see some of uh, you know uh, famous works uh, written by Barthes okay his insistence is that literature as well as literary criticism as well as language itself is never neutral and that this that the specificity of literature can be examined only within the context of a semiology or a general theory of science. So basically what is this semiology that this is a theory of sign. His idea about language and author and their relationship with social world promoted culture, cultural studies as well as reader response theory. So my dear students these are the products of his you know uh, of his creations. Okay language as well as literary criticism or literature are you know uh, never neutral okay so the in the formulation of text you could see in the formulation of language literary criticism or literature you could see the certain factors which are involved in the formulation for example psych psychology is also very much important anthropology is also important so he gives importance to anthropological and you could see like uh, to psycho uh, analytical theory as well so my dear students according to him like uh, this literature can be examined only within the context of a semiology so what is basically this semiology that is a general theory of science like language is a sign okay like for example whatever is written in front of you that is not only language like the other pictures the images for example different uh, kind of uh, you know scenes those are in front of you those uh, are also part of uh, language so he introduces this concept of semiology uh, as well over here while examining language or literature okay Another very impo important literary figure in postmodernism is Jacques Lacan. He was a French uh, psychoanalyst, also most controversial since Fred. Lacan has had an immense influence on the literary theory of our time, as well as on philosophy, feminism and psychoanalysis. Most of his important writings are included in his uh, acryls. His writings full of allusions to surrealism contend that the unconsciousness is structured like a language. His writings full of allusion to surrealism contend that the unconscious is structured like a language. His notion of the fragmented body clearly shows his debt to surrealism. So my dear students, he was a follower of uh, surrealism. That is, that is what we've discussed in, you know, the modern era in the history of English literature. So my dear students, here you can see like his writings, these are full of uh, allusions, okay? The kind of indirect language that he has used in his writing. So my dear students, you could see like uh, he is trying to say like uh, unconscious uh, is just like, uh, uh, just like, uh, language so my dear students this language the use of language or the formulation of language that is an unconscious process according to Jacques Lacan okay he elaborates an immensely broad synthetic uh, vision in which uh, psychoanalysis appropriates the findings of philosophy, the structural anthropology of uh, Lewis Torres and uh, the linguistics of Saussure. He also heavily relies on Jacobson's works of uh, phoneme analysis and metaphor metonymy. He defines language as a synchronic system of signs which generates meanings through their interaction. In other words, Meaning exists in and through a chain of signifiers and does not reside in any one element. For him, there is never any direct correspondence between signifier and signified, and meaning is therefore always in danger of sliding and slipping out of control. So, my dear students, here you could see like uh, we are talking about one more uh, domain of linguistics or the subfield of linguistics that is cognitive linguistics, the relationship of language uh, with society and mind. So, my dear students, basically he relies on Jacobson's work. He was a cognitive linguist, so his uh, uh, work uh, on phoneme analysis and of metaphor and metonymy as well so you could see like uh, thought is uh, unconscious that is uh, metaphorical that uh, that was the notion of uh, his theory so my dear students uh, he also uh, you know based his concepts on you know uh, socios uh, concepts of you know signifier and signified as I told you before fine so basically this is like a meaning our focus here is on meaning okay
So dear students here you can see like this uh, meaning is therefore always in danger of sliding and slipping. Okay dear students you have to keep in mind like meaning is not static, meaning is not fixed, it is not bound, it is always sliding and this is slipping and that is uh, out of control as well because uh, it depends upon you know the context upon you know the certain factors which are involved in the formulation of language and the, ultimately those uh, factors would contribute into the formulation of meaning as well. So, so this is uh, his concept in the most postmodernism and his contribution as well. So dear students here you can see like uh, he provides the uh, basis of his work uh, you know on uh, uh, on cognitive linguistics plus uh, on Sussurian's concept of language as well okay where he gave the concept of uh, signifier and uh, uh, signified okay. Michael Bakhtin, he is uh, another very important theorist uh, in postmodernism. Okay, a Russian literary theorist, Bakhtin has been a great influence on the contemporary theory of discourse analysis. So, my dear student, this is I'm just uh, uh, trying to introduce another term that is, uh, you know, uh, about research in language or in applied language. So, here you can see this is discourse analysis, that is the analysis of language in action or in language in use. He is best known by his works, names the dialogic imagination, speechless Jonas and other late essays, Rebelize and his wall and problems of uh, Dostoevsky poetics. So my dear students, these are his best known works. So basically he talks about uh, dialogic imagination a lot, okay, but because thought is dialogic. For example, when a person is thinking about something, so that is dialogic. So he's engaged in a dialogue with, uh, with himself and uh, his mind. So basically the aim of, uh, you know, uh, putting him in um, postmodernism is uh, you know the, this concept of uh, dialogism okay so So you have to keep in mind that Ma Michael Bach Bachtin gave the concept of dialogism that your thought is dialogic. So it is, you can say, a two-way process. So when you think about something, so you are engaged in a dialogue with your mind. So basically that was his concept, okay? In these studies, there is a crit critique of Russian formalism and an outline of his characteristic theme of dialogism. So here, as I told you before as well, like uh, he is famous for his uh, theme of uh, dialogism. He criticizes formalism and its abstraction for its failure to analyze the content of literary work and for the difficulty it finds in analyzing uh, uh, linguistic and ideological changes. So basically, my dear students, the notion here is that of uh, so basically he is very very much famous for his concept of dialogism so Bakhtin is trying to say like uh, he basically criticizes a formalistic uh, approach uh, to towards language as well where they say like everything uh, uh, whatever is in front of you that is language that is you know that represents your thoughts so he was very much against that point okay this critique is then extended to linguistics, especially by Sussurian. In his view, the purely linguistic approach to both language and literature is highly limited in scope. It tends to isolate linguistic units or literary texts from their social context, having no analysis to offer of the relations that exist between both individual speaker and text. So my dear students here, uh, that uh, critique was later on ext extended by Saussure. Okay. My dear students, here you can see like we cannot uh, analyze any text if we miss the social context and you know here we'll have to observe you know the uh, the connection of that text with the other text as well. So my dear students, like individual speakers and text, those are very much important for each other. Okay, so basically we'll have to observe the relationship between individual speaker and text according to you know Bakhtin and according to Saussure. Fine. Bakhtin's proposal is for a historical poetics or a translinguistics which can show how all social intercourse is generated from verbal communication and interaction and that linguistic signs are conditioned by the social organization of the participants 
In his later work, Bakhtin develops his historical poetics into a history of speech genres or typical form of utterances. So, my dear students, here again we are talking about translinguistics or historical poetics where we could show like uh, uh, he is giving importance to verbal communication and interaction. Interaction. So, basically, he is saying that we formulate the words, we formulate the meanings of the word by interacting with the people by communicating with other people of the society. So, basically, these are the things which are involved in the formulation of meaning okay uh, and again one more thing the, the linguistic signs are conditioned by the social organization so here we cannot even ignore society in the formulation of uh, meaning so my dear students here is just trying to say that we cannot ignore the social organization of the participants from the text okay or from uh, you can say the formulation of meaning okay so here you could see like uh, uh, in his later works he develops uh, his historical poetic into a theory so basically that was a uh, uh, you know just a concept previously and then he developed it like a theory of speech genres or typical forms of utterances. so basically in uh, you know in his later works you could see the element of speech genres and uh, a typical form of utterances as well uh, you know in this work okay he claims that the weakness of socio as linguistic is that it focuses solely on individual utterances and is unable to analyze how they are combined into relatively stable types of utterance. Although his speech theory remains incomplete, Bakhtin was ambitious to apply it to everything from uh, proverbs to long novels by analyzing their common verbal natures. So my dear students, again here you could see like he is uh, rejecting socio's ideas where he just uh, you know focused on uh, individual utterances only so basically the things which are involved in the formulation of those utterances these are you can say very much important aspects for Bakhtin okay so he uh, although if we talk about his speech theory uh, that is still incomplete okay Bakhtin was ambitious to apply to everything from proverbs to long novels so basically he, he is just trying to adopt that dialogism uh, you know concept so basically he was just trying to you know um, uh, combine uh, everything over here like the social uh, circumstances uh, which are involved in the formulation of text or of an utterance so those are very much important so he tried to analyze it from the level of proverbs of single statements to long novels so basically my dear students here you can see like uh, according to him in a nutshell I'm just trying to explain his uh, you know uh, point of view about uh, language and about thought and about utterances over here that is uh, you know this is also a part of applied linguistic as well that uh, thought is dialogic when you are engaged in communication when you are you know talking to somebody so definitely it would help you in formulation of meaning and with the passage of time those win meanings would become do your ideologies and you, you cannot ignore you know the social conditions plus ideologies of any society while interpreting meaning or while uh, talking about meaning all right well, you could see over here, like uh, with these major intellectual influences in the background, the postmodern literature in the second half of the 20th century grew to show greater impact of the ideas on the continent and in America with comparatively much less impact on the literature of the British Islands. So my dear students here it would definitely affect the continent a lot and America and comparatively it was not that much effective for British Islands. So my dear students here this is a, uh, a doctrine this is a philosophy that was uh, uh, going on all over the world like uh, they rejected the you know objectivity or you know the universal truths or the scientific truths like we cannot judge anything on the basis of formulas like it is not so as far as meaning is concerned that that is very much flexible so the factors which are involved in the formulation of meaning those are very much important for all these intellectuals okay mostly used as a periodizing concept to mark literature in the later half of the 20th century postmodernism is also used as we have earlier discussed as a description of literary and formal characteristics such as linguistic play new modes of relational self-reflexivity 
and uh, refractional frames within frames going chronologically and uh, genre wise we shall try to explore the nature and extent of postmodernism the literature in britain absorbed and reflected during the period beginning with the 1950s so my dear students uh, that postmodern and uh, modernism was started uh, in the second half of the 20th century so we'll talk about that so my dear students so, so far we have talked about uh, you know uh, certain you know theories and the postmodernism so we'll analyze a novel so we'll check its uh, impact on you know um, uh, postmodern novel and romana okay so here this is again you can say the nature of a theories or the nature of meaning the nature of you know interpretation or you know the formulation of text these are very much important aspects of uh, you know post uh, modernism okay Postmodern novel, as I told you at the start of the lecture, that today we'll focus on postmodern novel plus postmodern drama. Okay, postmodern novel. After Hitler's uh, devastation of Britain, the country was literally in ruins, torn apart by years of uh, bombardment. The landscape of ruins must also be recognized as forming an integral part of much of the literature of the late 1940s and the early 1950s. It was a landscape which provided a metaphor for broken lives and spirits. Britain at that time was uh, basically a landscape of ruins of disaster. So you could see like that is why this uh, post-modern novel that is known as po uh, post-war novel as well. So you will definitely see the elements of war, of disaster, of you can say of brutality over here in the novels. All right. One of the best expressions in fiction of this reign and its implication is a novel, The World, My Wilderness, by a female novelist of the post-war period named Rose McCauley. The novel's London is not only post-war but also post-Iliatic, okay? Here you belong, you cannot get away. You do not wish to get away for this, the Macchus that lies about the margins of the wrecked world. And here your feet are set. Where are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess. But you can say, you can guess that it is you yourself, your own roots that clutch the stony rubbish, the branches of your own being that grow from it and nowhere else. So my dear students, here you could see like uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, this uh, this is basically an expression of the post, uh, you know, modern novel, okay. Macaulay was of course not the only one to view the post-war period as one requiring the resemblance of fragments of life and meaning. So basically, again, you can see there is, uh, you know, assemblage of, uh, you could say, life and, you know, there wasn't any proper ending because again there was a chaos in society you could see like uh, there was brutality in society P like there were too many incidents which were going on and people they do not have you know uh, good past so my dear students uh, here you could see the, uh, clearly see the reflection of war on uh, you know novels okay another female novelist of the period Elizabeth Bowen also gave powerful expression to the post-war experience in her the death of the heart okay look at all those roses demon lover the heat of the day and the little girls equally important am among the post-war novelists was another female writer rebecca west that was basically the pen name of uh, cecily isabel fairfield okay whose the fountain overflows and the birds fall down depict the same devastated world with her pen name derived from an Ibsen play and actively involved in the feminist cause West wrote on political climate of the Cold War era. So my dear students, again you could see like a, a war has you know a very great impact on the writings of that era. So you could see again like uh, in the writings of uh, you know two female writers you could see like uh, how England was a devastated world at that time. So here you could see like uh, in all, almost all the novels uh, war elements would be there, there would be destruction okay. Graham Greene, this is another major novelist uh, in the postmodern era. A major novelist of the postmodern or contemporary period was Graham Greene, okay, 
who frequently gave direct expression to his pessimism such as for a writer success is always temporary or success is only a delayed failure so my dear students here you could see like in these two uh, you know sentences you could see like the, his pessimistic attitude towards life so here when uh, while commenting on writer he is saying that the uh, writer's success is just uh, you know temporary so it is not permanent success is only a delayed failure so my dear students this is a delayed but this is a failure at at the same time which he made in his autobiographical memoir a sort of life so this is basically his uh, uh, autobiographical uh, novel okay he emerged a popular writer with his very first novel the comedian that was published in 1965 uh, with he was a star anti imperialist who resented the rising imperialism of america and despised the crumbling empire of britain he remained a roman catholic since 1926 when he was admitted to the roman church so my dear students basically this was all about uh, you know uh, graham green like the way he in, you know wrote certain novels and uh, uh, this is about his religion as well okay so basically he was uh, he was very pessimist in his approach okay Almost all of his work is haunted by the themes of bounded world of the European col colonies in Africa or the American imperialism in Latin America, a gloomy sense of sin and moral failure, and a commitment to others and rebels. Although Green produced as many as 26 novels, those necessary to know are The Power and the Glory, focused on the character of a whiskey priest in anti-clerical Mexico, The Ministry of Fear. both of which are located in the 12 uh, blights london so my dear students uh, here you can see like in every uh, like uh, there was a gloomy sense of uh, sin and moral failure in the society of that time so you could see a clear depiction of uh, all the happenings of the society here in his works okay this is another these are some other works uh, written by uh, green okay these are some other works written by green the heart of the matter that was published in 1948 focused on the fly blown rat infested and war blitz west african colony the quiet american set in vietnam and our men in havana set in cuba both expose the american imperialism all of these novels present a grim picture of the world that emerged in the post war period so my dear students again you could see the effect of war everywhere in all uh, all the novels almost okay Anthony Powell uh, is another novelist of the period okay whose sequence of 12 novels collectively named A Dance to the Music of Time is neither a fictionalized war memoir nor a prose elegy of the decline and fall of a ruling class however as a chronicle of british upper middle class life set between the 1920s and 1950s it necessarily takes the disaster disillusions inconveniences and changes of a society and its war in its uh, leisurely and mayor stride so my, my dear students uh, here again you could see the elements of war which are present here in in you know uh, his novels as well once more okay so we talked about some novelists of the post modern era and you could see like the basic theme of their novels uh, at that time was uh, war okay the disaster in the society like the kind of chaos that was in society so you could see uh, like uh, too many cruel elements uh, which uh, were there in the formulation of society and uh, those are reflected in their novels as well now we are moving towards the post modern drama okay that is also known as the new theater okay drama of the post war period shares in some ways the dominant spirit of the ages we have it in novel and poetry from the 1950s onwards okay one thing that seems common to all the three is their concern with the life at the elemental level so my dear students as far as poetry novel and drama are concerned so all of them they all have the you know same common tradition okay wholly demystified and demythologized and with questions raised at the existential plane and without any attempt to seek soothing escape or magic solution to the problems of existence so my dear students that was very much common among the novelists among the dramatists at that time because they highlighted the war events all the time everywhere in dramas in you know in novels in poetry everywhere fine the central stance in all the literary forms seems to be to face the stark realities of life to take suffering as it comes and to learn to accept the unheroic status man seems to have been assigned to the absurd universe in which he is condemned to live mm -hmm. 
Drama of the postmodern period brings a still sharper focus on all these aspects than do its uh, uh, counterpart forms of poetry and novel. And to do that, drama of this period has been more daring than the other two. It has been more innovative uh, in technique, more shocking in defying social and moral convention. So basically, my dear students here, you could see the differences, uh, you know, uh, among different genres in the history of English literature during the modern, uh, post-modern period. Fine. So you you will see like uh, here when we talk about drama, so that is more daring. Okay, dramatists they they had more courage to face the realities and to present the realities in the theater at that time okay okay John Osborne he is uh, a dramatist in the postmodern period when John Osborne looked back uh, in anger was opened at the Royal Court Theatre. So basically, this is the name of his play, Look Back in Ang Anger. Okay. So when it was opened at the Royal Theatre on May 8, 1956, it at once made an impression that a dramatic revolution was afoot in England. The play was published in 1957. The early audiences did, however, feel shocked as well as its more sensitive critics into deeper response. The play shook the middle class values of the well made play. Founded by Ibsen and practiced in England by Shaw and uh, Galsworthy. The audiences saw in Osborne's play a new kind of drama which addressed the issues of the day. What was new about this drama was neither its politics nor its technique, too much as its alarm in rancor language and setting. So, my dear students, here you can see like some of the elements were taken from Ibsen's drama, some are from, you know, um, uh, Shaw's and uh, Galsworthy dramas as well. So it was basically uh, his first work that was uh, open in the Royal Court Theatre in 19, uh, you know, uh, 56. Okay, and the name of the drama is Look Back in Anger. So again, that is, you can say, a kind of uh, um, uh, a kind of story that is relevant to the middle class of that society. Okay. The new the theater ended the reign of country drawing room setting with its moral cant and its series. So, my dear students, previously when we were talking about drawing room theater in the modern era, so here that that is just basically the end of that theater. It introduced instead the provisional bed sitter with its abusive noises and its ironing board. The conventional theoretical illusion of need and stratified society was replaced by dramatic scenes of untidy and antagonistic social group grating upon one and others now so my dear students here you can see like uh, this is also known as observed theater as well so previously it was just like a drawing room theater so here you could see like the elements of irony which are very really pre present over here and uh, you can say the untidy society is their representation of untidy society the uh, you can say the society which does not uh, you can say follow and any kind of uh, morals okay so basically this is a true depiction of that very particular particular society over here in the theater so my dear students we are talking about the new theater theater in the history of English literature and that is in the postmodern era okay there may not have been any change in the social class of these characters but there had decidedly come about a change in their assumptions and conversations other plays by Osborne include epitaph by George Dillon the entertainer Luther Inadmissible evidence, a party for me, west of Sue's, a sense of detachment and watch it come down. His autobiography is a better class of person and uh, almost a gentle and a miscellany of uh, reviews and letters. Damn you, England, to make interesting reading. So, by dear students, here some of uh, you know the great works which are which are done by Isabon. You could see over here on this slide. Okay. Samuel Beckett, another you can say a very important literary figure in the history of English literature and he belongs to the postmodern era. Okay, Although considered a foreign influence because waiting for Godot reached England via France, Samuel Beckett was in fact the real pioneer of the new theatre in Europe. So for the very first time he, he introduced the concept of the new theatre in Europe, including England. His much more radical drama than Osborne's had been launched quite a few years earlier than Osborne's. His Waiting for Godot was staged in Paris in 1953 and then in London at the Small Arts Theatre in 1955 and had created sensation all over Europe, which must have influenced the composition of uh, Osborne's play as well. 
Beckett was an Irish by birth, but from 1937 onward, permanently resided in Paris, wrote his drama as well as fiction in French, only later to be translated in English. So my dear students, it was for the very first time you could see like he introduced the concept of new theatre in the history of English literature, plus uh, his uh, dramas were very much famous all over Europe, okay? So th this is basically the point of discussion over here, like you'll have to keep in mind his masterpiece that is waiting for God over here, okay? Earlier he had worked with his fellow Irish writer James Joyce and his Parisian circle becoming a part of the uh, polyglot and uh, polyphonic world of literary innovations. Beckett's plays include besides Waiting for Godot and Game, Crap Last Tape and Happy Days. His Come and Go is a stark uh, dramatic tale with three female characters and a text of 121 words so basically this is just a, a very you can say uh, a short drama over here you could see like only with the three female characters are there and that is comprised of only 121 words so my, my dear students here you can see in this slide you can see some of the eminent works other than waiting for godot by samuel bucket over here okay then there is the even more minimal breadth a 30 second play consisting only of a pile of rubbish, a breath and a cry. There is also a play called Not I, a brief fragmented dis uh, disembodied monologue by an actor of uh, indeterminate sex of whom only the mouth is illuminated. All these plays are revolutionary in different ways. So my dear students here, you can see like how he brought the concept of new theater in England by, you know, coming up with very short uh, dramas, okay, like uh, one drama that is, th there you could see only three characters and 131 words are there. And he, this is just a 30 second play, okay. So my dear students, that is why he brought a new tradition in the English theater. That is why this is also known as, uh, you could see, uh, a revolution once more in English drama, okay. Back at interest in the functioning and uh, malfunctioning of the human mind reflected by gaps, jumps and lurches remains at the center of his fiction as well as drama. We see voices both interrupting and inheriting trains of thought begin elsewhere or nowhere. So my dear students here you will see too many overlappings are there, too many repetition of ideas and images and phrases are there. So definitely those are not without any purpose. Uh, when you analyze his, his drama, so definitely you will get to know like uh, how bored uh, you know his dramas apparently are. But if you go into the deeper analysis uh, of his drama, so you'll f you'll be uh, interested in that one. Okay. We also see separated consciousness both impeding and impressing themselves uh, on one another. Beckett's dialogue for which his waiting for Godot is especially remarkable remains the most energetic. It is densely woven but uh, equally supple. His settings are bare just as his language is bald. In Waiting for Godot, for instance, there is only a country road and a tree. So, my dear students, here you could see the settings of, you know, the stage in the Waiting for Godot. Both, in fact, incomplete even as road and tree. The tree gets only four leaves in the second act. In the first, it remains without leaves. So, my dear students, definitely these leaves signify something on the stage. Okay, so when you will read this drama, so definitely you will get to know certain images over there. Okay, and how boring that theater would be. And but it it does signify something of that time. Okay. As for the characters, there are only two pairs uh, who occupy the stage by turns all through the play. The dialogue also runs into repetitive phrases and sentences and subjects leading to no conclusion or results. Beckett uses blindness and other disadvantages or he does in both uh, Endgame and Waiting for Godot suggesting that one kind of uh, deprivation may sharpen the other organs of perception in a character. So my dear students, here you will see a lot of repetition in his work that is the waiting for Godot, okay? So when you will analyze that uh, drama, so you will get to know that how repetitive dialogues uh, would be there. There are too many interruptions plus uh, overlapping is also there. So I previously I told you about the settings of the stage in that drama that is like uh, only one tree is there and one country is there. So tree is having a uh, no leave uh, in uh, act one and it will get few leaves the four leaves only in another act so definitely it symbolizes something of that era okay
So my dear students here you could see like I told you about the new theater in the history of English literature that is in the more postmodern period. So we talked about the novelists of uh, that era as well and then previously uh, at the start of the lecture today we continued our discussion with the postmodernism okay like uh, about uh, the theories of the postmodernism okay. So my dear students by keeping in view all those theories here you could see the application of that one as well like that was uh, an age of you can say where uh, there were too many disasters were going on on in English society so you could see over there like the elements of war present here but here in Samuel Bucket's play you'll find out uh, entirely a new tradition okay, okay dear students uh, as a as you know that we started our discussion with the uh, postmodernism and then we moved towards the post-war uh, novel and drama and we uh, discussed you know um, two novelists and two dramatists uh, from the postmodern period okay so uh, we are here now uh, towards uh, discussing some of the important points which are very much pro present there in the postmodern period as far as the novels and romas are concerned okay so these are some of the characteristics of uh, uh, the literature of that time okay my dear students as you can see like on this slide it is written irony playfulness uh, black humor okay so these are you can say three uh, characteristics okay we'll talk about uh, more uh, you can say uh, things about uh, postmodern literature but here our focus is on irony playfulness and black humor okay Linda Hutchian claimed postmodern fiction as a whole could be characterized by the ironic uh, quote marks uh, that much of it can be taken as tongue-in-cheek so my dear student this is an ironical comment on postmodern literature because that was an irony on the society irony on uh, science you can say irony on uh, the thoughts of that time okay this irony along with black humor so here my dear students uh, that's uh, written in an ironical way if you for example want to analyze Samuel Bucket uh, play waiting for Godot so that is a satire or you can say irony on that very society okay so here it is this irony is not uh, uh, you can say present alone it is mixed up with uh, you can say black humor so what basically is black humor when you attack anything in a very negative way okay in order to create uh, humor okay for example you're talking about something serious and uh, on the spot you add up some of the elements of humor in your writing okay and the general concept of play related to Derrida's concept or the ideas advocated by Ronald Barathas in the player of the text are among the most recognizable aspects of postmodernism. So my dear students here you can say like uh, they played uh, with uh, you can say the emotions and the feelings of uh, the writers of that time plus uh, one more thing like the um, uh, tradition of using black humor was very much common plus uh, I irony on the society and on the different characters of the society as well as uh, we had a debate on waiting for Godot like how uh, only few characters are there two characters are there and one uh, one character would play a minor role only so how they are there on the stage and uh, there is a tree on the stage as well and you'll see two leaves uh, in uh, in another act in, in on that tree so what basically is the point of discussion over here okay like uh, by analyzing some of the things like uh, this uh, modern world or you can say this uh, 20th century is very much uh, complicated to understand so here it would give us a margin of uh, as many um, interpretations as we can okay so dear my uh, my dear students uh, you just have to keep in mind that how postmodern literature is uh, different from other literatures uh, for example if you could see the ironical elements uh, in the Victorian age so you won't be able to see the elements of black humor over there in most of the Victorian novels okay and playfulness as well so this uh, playfulness term is uh, particularly for uh, you know uh, drama so dear students here uh, one more thing which is uh, you can say Derrida's concept of uh, you can say deconstructionism as well you'll see over here okay deconstruction and one more terminology that is of 
play over here okay so what this play is if we relate it to deconstructionism like uh, you are playing with the emotions and with the feelings of your uh, audience okay so here this thing is uh, very much important so by keeping in view ironical statements playfulness and uh, black humor will move uh, forward okay Though the idea of employing these in literature did not start with the postmodernists, the modernists were often playful and ironic. They became central features in many postmodern works. So, my dear students, here, when you talk about irony, playfulness, or uh, black humor, so these traditions uh, were being followed by the modernists as well. So, here, they, uh, these uh, modern uh, postmodernists did not take a start uh, of uh, you know using these terminologies, using these concepts in their plays. This was uh, previously started by the modernists. Okay, so here, my dear students, uh, you could see some of the similar elements uh, you can say between two periods. Okay, so what things are basically uh, you know similar in both the eras. My dear students, as I kept to, uh, kept on telling you many times, like uh, some of the things are you know similar in many eras as well. Okay. So when you compare them, so this is uh, one of the things which is uh, uh, you can say um, similar in uh, modernism and postmodernism. Okay. In fact, several novelists uh, later to be labeled postmodern was for, were first collectively labeled black humorists. So this was uh, another terminology which is relevant to postmodernists. Okay, like they were previously when this uh, postmodernism concept was not uh, there in the society or like in any uh, field so my dear students at that time they those writers they were known as uh, uh, black humorists okay for example John Barth, Joseph Heller, William Gaddis, uh, Kurt Vanguard, Bruce J. Uh, Friedman so my dear students uh, they are uh, you can say many more authors as well who were uh, you can say known as uh, uh, black humorists at that time it's common for postmodernists to treat serious subjects in a playful and humorous way. For example, the way Heller, Vanegat, and uh, Panchon address the events of World War II. So basically, this is a tragedy. World War II is a tragedy. It's all about killing of human beings. So the way they have addressed that uh, event, uh, World War II, in uh, their place, that is uh, quite uh, humorous. Like when you are uh, uh, telling something to your reader in a humorous way, you make fun of that thing. Like uh, at the, uh, like uh, that thing is, uh, you can say, uh, a toy for you. Okay, the way you are treating that thing, it does not matter to you at all. So that is known as black humor. So you could see over here, like uh, they made, uh, you can say fun of World War Two. okay so basically that is a, a satire on the society as well okay the central concept of Joseph Heller's uh, Catch-22 is the irony of the new idiomatic Catch-22 okay so this is basically a new idiomatic, uh, idiomatic expression Catch-22 and the narrative is structured around a long series of similar ironies okay Thoman's Pachon is, uh, in particular, provides prime examples of playfulness, often including silly word play within a seri serious context. Okay, the crying of uh, uh, Lot 49, for example, contains characters named Mike uh, Fallopian and Stanley Cortex and radio station called KCUF, while the novel as a whole has a serious subject and a complex structure. So, dear students, here you can see like uh, some of the examples uh, from postmodern uh, postmodern literature. The way they made fun of uh, you can say certain events uh, during that era. Okay, so although the context is quite serious, uh, but the characterization or you can say the sequence of uh, different events over there that made fun of uh, you can say any serious issue which was going on in the society. So here, when you go for, you can say, the hidden meaning of the novel, uh, different novels, uh, like those who are, uh, you can say, based on black humors. So my dear students, their subject is quite uh, serious and uh, they also have complex structure.
So my dear students, as I told you, when we were doing, uh, you can say, uh, analyzing uh, some kind of literary works, uh, like uh, the way you'll have to appreciate, encourage, and you'll have to explore the hidden meaning of any text. So here, the same concept would be applicable. How? Because uh, uh, apparently something on the surface level that is uh, humorous to you, that is the funny thing. So uh, if you go for, uh, you can say, the exploration of the text or the hidden agencies which are working behind that text so you'll definitely find a, a complex structure plus uh, uh, you can say serious themes behind the text okay those so these are some of the characteristics of the post modern literature okay Intertextuality, another concept which was, uh, you know, introduced uh, during the postmodern era. Since postmodernism represents a decentered concept of the universe in which individual works are not isolated creations, much of the focus is on the study of uh, postmodern literature uh, is on intertextuality, the relationship between one text, a novel, for example, and another or one text within the interwo interwoven fabric of uh, literary history. So my dear students here, basically you'll have to go and uh, explore the relationship of that text with the other text and if not with other texts, uh, you'll have to go for, you can say, uh, the uh, you know the history of that text or you can say the history of the author as well okay so here you cannot uh, uh, deal with any text uh, as a separate entity or text uh, as itself uh, so you you'll have to explore the relationships of uh, you can say that text with the other text plus uh, with the historical events okay so here we are talking about the literary history of the text as well okay so my dear students intertextuality is you can say like uh, when you mix up s different texts or when you study a text with relation to other texts so that is very much important so when you will be doing research in literature so definitely this intertextuality concept would be very much important at that time and this is one of uh, the product of uh, postmodernism okay so this is uh, one of the important aspect of uh, uh, you can say postmodern doctrine so my dear students here what is basically the concept of uh, discussing intertextuality with you for example if you want to analyze uh, Samuel Bucket uh, um, drama that is waiting for God or any other drama so definitely you cannot uh, study that text in isolation you just have to go into the history of other text plus the relationship of other text with that waiting for God okay so here you you are going to have a broader look on the text or on any play okay Critics uh, point to this as an indication of postmodernism's lack of originality and reliance on clutches. Intertextuality in postmodern literature can be a reference or parallel to another literary work, an extended discussion of a work, or the adaption of the of a style. In postmodern literature, this commonly manifests as references to fairy tales, as in works by uh, Margaret Atwood, Donald Bartholomew, and many others, or in references to popular genres such as uh, sci-fi and detective fiction. So these are, you can say, different genres of literature. So my dear students, here basically, as I told you, when you, you can say, discuss uh, any style or when you comment on any particular style of any writer, so definitely you'll have to relate it with the other literature literary works which are done by the same writer okay so here you this is basically an extend extended discussion of a work so you are not um, focusing on work in isolation definitely you'll have to cope up with the trends of the society plus the trends which the writer has followed in many other texts okay so here that is why most of the people say that postmodernism uh, it lacks the originality and reliance on clutches so here basically that's not original work like when you talk about uh, you can say any play any novel that was written during the postmodern period so my dear students uh, critics uh, they criticized uh, on this thing like uh, no work is original when there are too many connections uh, with the other texts with the historical events so they were against it but uh, intertextuality concept was first developed by postmodernism okay so my dear students here uh, let me again repeat a few things to you people like uh, what is basically the main philosophy of postmodernism that is to look at the reality to look at the truth from different perspective to you can have a more than 
and one interpretation of the text. So, for example, my dear students, uh, the concept of intertextuality, if you could analyze that thing, uh, so, uh, for example, when you have to analyze any novel that is written in a postmodern period, so definitely you cannot read, you cannot analyze or appreciate that text in isolation. You'll have to study that text in relation to other texts or the historical development of novel as well. For example, if you want to have, a, you can say, have a look on uh, Elizabethan uh, tragedies, for example, so what are basically the things which are common in Elizabethan tragedies and uh, the dramas which which is produced in the modern era. So my dear students, by focusing on these things, like when you try to create a relationship between one text and other texts plus, uh, you know, the events or you can say the development of the text, so that is known as, uh, uh, you know, a text intertextuality, okay? So this is a quite an interdisciplinary approach once more, like you cannot uh, discuss one discipline in terms of, uh, you can say, that discipline only or in isolation, you definitely will have to have a broader look uh, on, uh, you can say, different other genres, plus if you are doing the research in the same genre, so definitely you'll have to consult the works of the same author, okay, different other works of the same author, then you'll have to uh, create links of different works over here, and uh, in order to find out uh, the autobiographical elements of any particular kind of work, or if you want to have uh, a look on the society of that time, so definitely uh, for giving proofs of anything, you'll have to relate your discussion to many other texts. So here, my dear students, we are moving towards a, a criticism, okay? So when you criticize something, when you give your critical commentary on something, definitely you cannot study the text in isolation, okay? So you'll have to relate the, your text to certain other texts. So my dear students, um, these are some of the core concepts which you have to keep in mind while analyzing postmodern literature and how far that literature is different from modernism. So let me tell you once more like uh, irony, playfulness and black humor. These are the things which were introduced by the by the modernists. So this is not a product, entirely a product of uh, uh, postmodernism, but it was uh, practiced, uh, you can say, during the postmodern uh, era a lot. So dear students, uh, while analyzing any kind of text, novel, uh, you can say, or poetry during certain uh, periods, so your critical commentary about that thing is very much important. Where is your opinion about that thing? Like, it's very easy to read out any novel for prayer purposes or for enjoyment purpose only. So that's uh, not the case uh, as far as you can say postmodern literature is concerned. It's very complex to understand, okay? You'll have to analyze each and every line plus each and every act or or different characters in a different way, okay, in relation to other characters. So the relationship is very much important in postmodern era. So my dear students, by keeping in view the broader aspect of analyzing the literature, you can see like we have entered into a new era in the history of English literature that is known as postmodernism and how postmodernism is different from, uh, you can say, the previous era, so everything is obvious uh, to you, okay? So the things would be more clear to you when we'll be doing, uh, you know, postmodern criticism, okay? So my dear students, that is all about today. You know, uh, we we are so far covered with the postmodern novel and postmodern drama as well, and uh, you know, postmodern philosophy. So, my dear students, uh, see you again with uh, another topic in the history of English literature. So, hope you are getting the things. Have a nice day. Allah Hafiz.